as always. Thanks, Pat. That's a, is that on is that on new C D series please? Is that on? No. Yeah, I will. Yeah, thanks. So I was just thought I'd give you a little plug there, but you know, hey, hey. Forthcoming from Pat Barker. Oh, no. Well the Lord be with you. Should have started with that, I guess. Um I'll be reading this morning from the eighteenth chapter of Luke's Gospel. Luke 18, verses 9 through 14 is where we will be this morning. I still haven't gotten used to that thing being over my shoulder. I keep hearing a few pages turn, but I'll get used to it one day. Luke 18, verses 9 through 14, read this way. He also told this parable to some who trusted in themselves that they were righteous and regarded others with contempt. Two men went up to the temple to pray. <clears throat> one a Pharisee and the other a tax collector. The Pharisee, standing by himself, was praying thus, God, I thank you that I am not like other people, thieves, rogues, adulterers, or even like this tax collector. I fast twice a week. I give a tenth of all my income. But the tax collector, standing far off, would not even look up to heaven but was beating his breast and saying, God, be merciful to me, a sinner. I tell you, this man went down to his home justified rather than the other. For all who exalt themselves will be humbled, but all who humble themselves will be exalted. May God bless the reading and hearing of Holy Scripture. Would you pray with me? Eternal God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Lord, may now these ancient words impart your truth to us. May they change each one of us in this place. As your Holy Spirit speaks through them, Lord, as your Spirit speaks to us, calling us evermore into the kingdom, into the way of life you would have us all to live. So give us ears to hear these ancient words now, O Lord, our rock and our redeemer. We pray in Christ's name, amen. So Jesus says, two men went up to the temple to pray, or as Marleya said, and I like, two men walk into the temple. I like that. I mean, two men went up to the temple to pray. Isn't that a lovely thing? Two men. Entering into the sacred space, understood and reserved as the house of God. And they've come to pray. That's a nice thing. To commune with the Almighty. To spend time in the focused presence of God. That's a good thing. That's a pretty good way to introduce a parable. Especially this one. Jesus wants to teach his disciples then, his disciples now, about the dangers of trusting in oneself to be righteous while looking down your nose at others in contempt. And what a better way to sort of begin such a parable, to talk about such things, than through a parable of exemplary prayer. So Jesus says, two men walked into the temple to pray. It doesn't take long, though, before the wheels on this parable start to wobble. Just a little bit. Jesus says the two men went up to the temple to pray, and one was a Pharisee and one was a tax collector. Ah, there it is. So this isn't just Joe and his brother. This isn't just two nice friends, two neighbors. This isn't two ordinary men, two run-of-the-mill fellas kneeling in silent prayer in some candlelit corner of the temple. It's a Pharisee and a tax collector. Well, I suppose that may, may be one way to teach about the dangers of self-righteousness and the judging of others. After all, we all know about Pharisees, don't we? We know the kind of people Pharisees are. Just the word itself conjures up all sorts of, of Sunday school lessons and images of ancient, uptight religious folks in dark colored robes with scowls scratched across their bearded faces. Our minds quickly turn to images of those who go everywhere with their Bible tucked under their arm, their Jesus fish on the tailgate, and yet they act like angry little children in private 
and behave as if they've never even read the Scriptures. Whenever we hear the word Pharisee, we already have a pretty good picture in our mind of where Jesus is going to go with this story. The Pharisee is going to turn out to be a hypocrite, one who wears a, a, a personal persona of piety while privately parading his depravity. That's how we know Pharisees. That's what we know about Pharisees, right, when we read the Bible. But before we just rubber stamp him like the rest of his kind in our created Christian imaginations, let's hear him out. Let's hear his prayer. Let's hear the words that Jesus puts on his lips in this parable as he prays in the temple. For Jesus says, the Pharisee, standing by himself, was praying thus. Now isn't that interesting? Isn't that interesting? He's praying by himself. Standing off by himself. Keeping to himself is another way to translate that. This Pharisee isn't standing on the street corner, not on a soapbox, not with a megaphone in hand, not waving his signs of judgment at the passers-by. No, he hasn't, hasn't been shouting his prayers for his country, for his people, for his nation, there on the television, there on the corner. No. No, he doesn't even pull out his cell phone to tweet about it. He doesn't say, heading to the temple for some quality God time, hashtag blessed. Hashtag prayed up. Hashtag Ferris see you at the temple. He doesn't do that. No, there's nothing in this sort. This Pharisee seems to just really be keeping quietly to himself in prayer. Perhaps even modeling a bit of what Jesus taught in Matthew's gospel in the Sermon on the Mount. In chapter 6, verse 6 of that gospel, Jesus says, Whenever you pray, go into your room, shut the door, and pray to your Father who is in secret. And your father who sees in secret will reward you. Maybe, maybe this Pharisee was catching on. Quiet to himself. This Pharisee is keeping to himself. Praying by himself. Isn't it interesting? Isn't it interesting the sort of things we'll pray to ourselves? Especially those things we wouldn't dare pray out loud when other people are listening. When others aren't around to hear our prayers and we think we alone have got the ear of God all to ourselves, isn't it something the things we'll pray for? Lord, if it be thy will, please let Susie transfer next month. I'm tired of working with her. God, I'm thankful for all the things you give me. But if, if, they, just, if they could kick this field goal and they would get into the playoffs, I know they would. So Lord, I, I'll put it all, if you let them kick the field goal, I'll go to church every Sunday. We put it out there. Sometimes we're even, we can kind of even embarrass ourselves the things we'll pray for. Jesus, I wish you'd do something about my neighbor's dog. Barks all night, digs holes in my yard. I'm tired, I'm tired of dealing with the neighbor's dog. Isn't it something? The things we'll pray when no one's listening. When we think we're praying all to ourselves. I'd like to say that the Pharisee in this parable prayed something sort of that way. I'd like to think that this Pharisee prayed some pretty egregious prayers while he prayed alone in the temple. But to be fair, his prayer isn't all that terrible. God, I thank you I'm not like these other people, thieves, rogues, adulterers, or even like this tax collector. I fast twice a week. I give a tenth of all my income. Now, he could have worded it a bit better. There are always things we say that we, we don't like the way we said them when we look back at them. Oh, I didn't mean that, especially in emails or text messages, those sorts of things. I didn't mean it that way. I mean, sure, he could have said it better. But it's a fine prayer, I suppose. After all, what's wrong with being thankful for who you are and what you've been given? Sure, it sounds a bit harsh to pray, God, thank you for not making me like those folks. But it wasn't like he was talking about his good neighbors, right? It wasn't like, uh, like he was talking about the other Pharisees in his Torah study class or those good, tithing, God-fearing, fasting folks who gathered together to sing songs, to read scripture and pray together. No, it wasn't like he walked down his street and looked at the numbers on the mailbox and said, God, I'm thankful I'm not like that one or that one or that one or that one. No. No, he was thankful he didn't turn out to be a thief. And who can fault him for that? How many of you, how many of you with grown children have ever prayed, God, thank you that they're all right? 
God, thank you that they turned out pretty good, that they're not locked up, that they haven't run off, that they're not strung out, that they're not broke. How many times? And, and some of us are a little cautious. We'll say, yet. But how many? How many of you prayed? That prayer? It's not a bad thing to thank God for. This Pharisee is thankful that he didn't wind up on the wrong side of the law, that God saw him through life to be a good, clean person. He's thankful he's not a rogue, an unjust, unrighteous person in opposition to that which is good and right in the world. Again, not a bad thing. Not a bad thing to pray about. He's even thankful. He says, Lord, I'm thankful that I'm not an adulterer, an awful, hurtful sinner who ruins his family and the lives of those in it. Thank you, God. I've been faithful. Thank you. He realizes, I suppose, where such power and righteousness comes from. It's not really a bad prayer, I guess. We may want to find fault with his words and his wording like when he says, not even like this tax collector. But the truth is, the truth is such a sentiment would have likely received more than one amen from those listening to Jesus' parable. You see, tax collectors were despised. And I suppose if you call yourself a tax collector, you'll be so dis, you know, despised anywhere you go. But, but in the ancient world, more than, more than any. They were seen as collaborators with the oppressors, with Rome. They took advantage of those from whom they collected taxes. If Rome said gather 10%, the tax collectors would go out and take 15 and keep the rest for themselves. They were often taking advantage of those who, from whom they were, withdrew their taxes. And Jewish tax collectors, those who were Jews hired by the Romans to extract taxes from Jews, were even more were even worse. They were held as especially egregious in their betrayal of their own people. So when the Pharisee says, God, I thank you that I'm not even like this tax collector, it may have been a bit rude to say so, but most folks would have thought nothing about it. They'd have just nodded their head, mm -hmm, thank God he's not a tax collector. You can be a lot worse, but thank God you're not a tax collector. They'd have simply nodded their head in agreement. It's a good thing not to be like a tax collector. And so after offering his thanks to God for all these things, the Pharisee winds up his prayer with a little bit of, let's call it a check-in with God. Thank you, God, for all this stuff. Oh, and by the way, I fast twice a week, and I give a tenth of all my income. This is the kind of guy most pastors want in their pews. He's there. Gives 10%. This Pharisee has his ducks in a row. He's not just fasting once a week or on the prescribed fast days. No, twice a week. Baptists can't even get half a day down. This guy does it twice a week. He's one of those folks who doesn't just come to worship on Sunday mornings. He comes to Sunday school, Wednesday night prayer meeting, Tuesday night Bible study, Thursday visitation, every single day of vacation Bible school. Whether you want him there or not, he goes across town, goes to the other Bible school. He goes to every event. He's there. And on top, on top of his stellar fa fasting schedule and commitment, He's a regular tither, writes the check, has his pledge card, writes the check down to a cent, 10% to a cent. Now, I suppose we have to take the Pharisee at his word. After all, he's just a character in one of Jesus' parables. But it's generally been my experience that whenever someone talks about how much they do, how much they give, how much they attend, they tend to be lying through their teeth in order to cover up some other insecurity. But if we take the Pharisee at his word, if we take what Jesus has said in this parable at his word, he's a standout man of faith. After all, where is he at? He's at the temple. He's praying to himself without making a show of it, and he's thankful to God as he recognizes that God hasn't let him fall into a life of ill repute while also blessing him enough to faithfully fast and consistently tithe. Isn't that great? God has blessed him enough to where he can have enough to eat to fast twice a week, to have enough to give 10% all the time. Isn't that great? He's always there. He's thanking God. So why does the tax collector go down to his home justified rather than this Pharisee? How is it that this Pharisee has exalted himself if he's just thanking God for what God has done for him? What is it about the tax collector's prayer that's so much better than the prayer of the Pharisee? 
I mean, Jesus tells us the tax collector standing far off would not even look up to heaven, was beating his breast and saying, God, be merciful to me, a sinner. The tax collector hardly finds himself worthy to be in the same place with the Pharisee. He's standing far off, out of earshot. Perhaps he knew the weight of his betrayal, the soul-crushing cost of swindling good folks out of their money in order to line his own pockets for the government. Maybe he knew his righteousness can never even come close to the one like the Pharisee. I suspect, I suspect the tax collector didn't even fast once a week and that the few times he did show up for service, when the offertory was played and the plate went by, he just passed it right on. Maybe even I did a little, wonder how I could slip a 20 out. Just passed it on down the pew. Perhaps he recognizes his own lowliness, brought on by his terrible vocational choices. He beats his chest, a sign of extreme repentance and mourning, cries out to God, have mercy on me, God. That's it. It's a simple prayer, a prayer of confession, a pleading for mercy in the light of one's realization that one has strayed from God. It's the prayer we will all make at some point. At some point in our lives, we will all say, and hopefully, hopefully more than once, it's the prayer that grounds us, reminds us that we cannot do or be anything on our own. And it's the prayer that reminds us that we are truly in need of God's mercy and grace. Because no matter how hard we try on our own, no matter how many schemes we may devise, no matter how many lies we may tell ourselves, each and every one of us will fall short of God's love. And we will over and over again, whether we're Pharisees, tax collectors, deacons, preachers, Sunday school teachers, harlots, drunks, whatever it is, we will fall short every single time. And such a prayer calls us back to the realization that while we may always fall short, God's mercy is sufficient to fill us with God's love all the more. Pharisee prayed, thanks God for the ways that God has provided for him, kept him free of a life of treachery and debauchery, and the tax collector prays for mercy. Yet Jesus says only the tax collector returns home justified. Why? Why? Two men went up to the airport to catch a flight. They were heading south of the equator to a remote village somewhere in the jungles of South America. They were from the same church, both skilled in medical missions. They spent seven days serving the peoples of that little village, catching a flight back home. When they returned, their church had asked if they, do you mind, could you share with us what happened that week? Share your experiences one Sunday morning in worship. So the two got together, and they put together a little presentation. The two of them stood before the congregation one Sunday morning. The first man talked of how difficult the trip was, how they landed in a small airport, how they loaded into trucks to ride for hours on rough roads, only to have to mount up on a couple of donkeys to make the last two hours of the trip into the village. He spoke of, about the children in the village, how none of them had shoes, how most of them were malnourished, and how they didn't go to school because the closest one was miles away over mountains and through rivers. He showed pictures of the little huts they all lived in, with the dirt floors and the thatched roofs, with the scorched spot in the corner where they burned a fire to cook whatever it was they called food. And he showed pictures. He showed pictures of the people they saw in their temporary little makeshift clinic, pictures of infections and long untreated diseases. He showed image after image of horrible conditions and heartbreaking poverty. And when he concluded his portion of the presentation, he looked out at the congregation and said, if I learned anything on this trip, I learned just how blessed we are, how blessed I am, that we have clean water, shoes on our feet, and plenty of food to eat. We ought to be thankful for all that God has given us. And tear-streaked faces shouted, Amen, Amen. Then the second man spoke. He showed a few of the same pictures told a few of the same stories. 
But before he was through, he looked out at the congregation and said, If I learned anything on this trip, I learned that I ought to be ashamed and that I am in need of repentance because I have clean water. I have shoes on my feet. I have plenty of food to eat. We ought to do something with all that God has given us. Not a single amen. Two prayers, two lessons. A Pharisee and a tax collector. Thankfulness and repentance. I wonder what God wants more. Hmm. Would you pray with me? Lord Jesus Christ, Son of God, have mercy on us, Lord, for we are all sinners, and we all stand in need of your mercy. Help us, Lord, when we know, when we see the ways, God, that you have blessed us, to not merely parade them out, to not simply sit them on the shelf and look at them and be thankful. But God, to know that you bless us in order that we may serve you and one another. So Lord, always call us on. On in the work of your kingdom. On in the work of repentance and restoration and forgiveness and salvation. Call us ever on, Lord, in the work of love in your kingdom. May we not be bogged down with simply thinking of how good we are how good we have it, but that, Lord, that you call us, Lord, you call us who are so blessed to bless others. So, Lord, have mercy on us as we come before you now. In Christ's name, amen.